you want to go on down. So. Yeah, leave the pens there, guys. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Logan. No worries. There you go. <laughs> there was a young Korean boy was a houseboy for some American soldiers. Sometimes they thought it was kind of funny to play tricks on him. They would tie his shoelaces together. They would lock him out of the house. They would make his life pretty difficult. And they never thought that it would probably bother him. And so, but finally, one day they realized that, you know, their practical jokes weren't very funny to him. And so they apologized to him and they said, you know, we're sorry that we did this. And he said, oh, that's okay. He said, I'll quit spitting in your soup now. <laughs> there are times when we think that getting even, like spitting in somebody's soup is okay. I mean, well, you know, it's pretty passive and half the time they don't even know we're doing it. So, I mean, that's, you know, we like to serve up our revenge, how subtle it could be. As Christians, we think that forgiveness should come easy, right? We think, ah, oh, yeah, we're Christians, or we think other people should think that, that, well, they're a Christian, they'll forgive me. I mean, that should be an easy thing to do. And it shouldn't be difficult. We should never have revengeful thoughts. But, you know, sometimes, in the, sometimes we say, you know, I forgive, but I'll never forget. And, you know, in a, in a, there is a place for that. Yes, we won't forget. But there is a place where we need to let it go. As Christians, we think that, you know, that maybe we're, we're better than that, and we don't ever go struggle with those feelings. But there's a lady named Corrie Ten Boom, and I know I've shared the one story, so I'm not sharing that one again. But it was a time where she forgave, she had spent time in Ravensbrück, a concentration camp. And when she got, she got out, at one time she was speaking on forgiveness, and one of the Nazi guards from that concentration camp had sought her forgiveness. And she struggled with that that day, but she did forgive him. But I want to take some of her words that were recorded in Guidepost magazine. And what she said was, she's, she's, if, the, if there's one thing I've learned at 80 years of age is that I can't store up good feelings and behavior, but only draw them fresh from God each day. Maybe I'm glad it's that way, for every time I go to him, she said, he teaches me something else. I recall the time some 15 years ago when some Christian friends whom I loved and trusted did something which hurt me. You would have thought that after her forgiven a Nazi guard, this would have been child's play. It wasn't. For weeks I seethed inside, but at last I asked God again to work his miracle in, him, in me. And again it happened. First the cold-blooded decision, then the flood of joy and peace. I had forgiven my friends. I was restored to my father, she said. Then why was I suddenly, in the middle of the night, hashing over the whole thing again. They were my friends, people I loved. If they'd been strangers, I wouldn't have minded so much. And the next night, she woke up again, and she said, they talked so sweetly, too, never a hint of what they were planning. Father, she cried out, help me. God's help came in the form of kindly Lutheran pastor to whom she confessed this failure to after two sleepless weeks. Up in that church tower, he said, he nodded out the window, is a bell which is rung by a sexton on a rope. But do you know what? After the sexton lets go of the rope, what happens with the bell? It keeps going, doesn't it? It keeps going for a while. First it dings and it dongs and it goes back and forth, slower and slower until finally a dong and it stops. I believe that's the same that is true of forgiveness, said Corey. When we forgive someone, we take our hand off the rope but if we've been tugging at our grievances for a long time, we mustn't be surprised if that, those old angry thoughts keep coming for a while. They're just the ding-dongs of that old bell slowly slowing down. And so it proved to be. There were a few more midnight reverberations, a couple of dings when the subject came up in conversation, but finally they happened less and less and then they quit altogether. So she thought she had discovered the secret of forgiveness and that we can trust God not only above our emotions, but above our thoughts. <laughs> and she wished it was finished, but he wasn't finished with her yet. So something happened in 1970, and an American whom she had shared this story with 
they had gotten together, and those friends that she had been angry with and hadn't forgiven at first, came. they were over. And then her friend said, weren't those the people that you were telling me about? And she said, yes. And he goes, well, he says, I know you've forgiven them, but have they asked for forgiveness? She said, no. They said, there's nothing wrong. I haven't, you know, they didn't do anything wrong. There's nothing that needs to be forgiven. But she goes, I can prove it to you. I still have their letters to me in my desk. And she goes, I can show them to you. And he grabbed her arm, and he goes, um, Corey, if you still have their letters, it says God throws our sins into the deepest, farthest part of the sea and never looks at them again. How do you keep their sins in black and white in your desk? And she was convicted one more time. She said, an anguishing moment, I couldn't find my voice, and then she prayed, Lord Jesus, who takes all my sins away? Forgive me for preserving all these years the evidence against others. Give me grace to burn all the blacks and whites as a sweet-smelling sacrifice to your glory. She goes, I didn't go to sleep that night till I got all this stuff out of my desk, and I put them in the fire, and I burned them all as a sweet-smelling sacrifice to the Lord. And she said, with that fire, all those things glowed and burned, and she said, so did my heart. Jesus said to forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. In the ashes of those letters, Corey said, I was seeing yet another facet of his mercy. What more would he teach me about forgiveness in the days ahead? She said, I don't know, but today was enough. <laughs> we bring our sins to Jesus, and he not only forgives them, but he perfectly forgets them. Corey had to deal with those feelings of unforgiveness. She had to rid herself of the bitterness and the anger and the evidence that she hung on to. How many of us have, have forgiven someone, but we held on to the evidence? We kept that tucked away back in our memory banks so that we would never be hurt again by that person. Or that if we got really angry, we could remember why we could be angry at them. We, we harbor those feelings of anger and bitterness and distrust. From the um, Health and Fitness Association, they back up the theory that says that unforgiveness is very detrimental to our health. It says recent research shows that the physical and mental health benefits of forgiveness can be startling because not forgiving, nursing a grudge is caustic. A proven prescription for, that's out of the book, a proven for prescription for health and happiness. Unforgiveness, it raises our blood pressure, it depletes our immune function, and makes you more depressed, and it causes enormous physical stress to your whole body. Those feelings of unforgiveness do more harm to us than they do to the person we haven't forgiven. We've got to let them go. When Paul wrote 2 Corinthians, this letter followed one where he had challenged the church to discipline a man in their congregation who was sleeping with his stepmother. Gross, right? I mean, just the thought of that. But that's, their culture was very, it was very mirrored our culture in a lot of ways. But the church was allowing the sin in their congregation under the guise of freedom. Paul said that they needed to address this issue, and the Corinthian church did. <clears throat> Excuse me. They let him know what he was doing was wrong, and he left the church for a time. While he was gone, evidently, according to this letter, he has repented, he has wanted to come back to the church, he is restored, and he wants to be restored back to the church at Corinth. But they're struggling with that. They're trying to figure out, they're having a hard time forgiving. They want to keep the punishment where it is. So Paul is addressing this in chapter 2 of 2 Corinthians. So if you would turn with me, and I don't have the page number. I think it's 986, maybe? 936. 936. Thank you, Brandy. I forgot to write it on my notes. Um, and it'll be on, up on the screen as well. But if we could read that together, and then we're going to be talking about that. So I made up my mind that I would not make another painful visit to you. For if I grieve you, who is left to make me glad but you whom I have grieved? I wrote as I did, so that when I came, I would not be distressed by those who should have made me rejoice. I had confidence in all of you, that you would all share my joy. For I wrote you out of great distress and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to grieve you, but to let you know the depth of my love for you. If anyone has caused grief, he has not so much grieved me as he's grieved all of you to some extent, not to put it too severely. The punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient. 
Now instead you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you therefore to reaffirm your love for him. Another reason I wrote you was to see if you would stand the test and be obedient in everything. Anyone you forgive, I also forgive. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. So in that first paragraph, Paul is sharing why he is writing them again instead of coming to them in person. He wanted their next visit to be a happy one. He didn't want to come out scolding. I mean, like many of us, we don't want to always be the bad guy. We don't want to always do that in our relationships or in our families. So Paul is saying, I'm sending this ahead so that you can get everything taken care of. And he is confident that they will heed his letter and act on what he is telling them. He has confidence in them. I like that. I like that he says, I have confidence in you. Don't we like to work for people that have confidence in us, that we're going to do the job they gave us to do? How many of us like to have somebody looking over our shoulder all the time, or checking our work all the time, or asking us how we're doing all the time? I mean, we, none of us like that. That just, try, I mean, for me, it just drives me crazy. And then I find I do it sometimes, and I hate it, when, and then I'm catching myself better. But I don't think anybody enjoys that. I don't even like somebody looking at watching me as I'm backing up the horse trailer. And I know they're not judging me. It's just that I get, I don't like somebody watching me. <laughs> and I do so much better when nobody's looking. <laughs> but that's, you know, that's just me. We, you know, and then there's parents that you've heard of helicopter parents. They hover and they just barely let their kids do anything. And so then they have a hard time learning how to do the right thing. We lack confidence in their ability to make good and godly choices. And often when we do that, we end up crippling them and helping to shape them to struggle instead of get better at making choices. We have a new puppy at home. She's about 10 weeks old. And we found that out the hard way as well, that we can't overcorrect her all the time. One day she, we had a really bad day with her. And the more we scolded her and cleaned up after, well, it was house training. I mean, y'all probably could figure that out, house breaking her. And the more we scolded her, the worse it was getting. It was like she was going every 10, 15 minutes. And finally, and I thought, gosh, there's something wrong with this dog. I'll have to take it to the vet. And then I Googled it, and I looked it up, and it said, when a puppy is anxious, they do that. So I took it out, and I played with her. And I talk, spoke calmly to her. And boy, she's been really great almost ever since. We've hardly had any accidents in, another, in a week. And I thought, OK. I mean, that's the way people are, too. We overcorrect them. We hover over them. And they have accidents. And I don't mean to say that people and puppies are the same. But in a lot of ways, we, we react the same way. Our feelings take over for us. When we truly let go and put confidence in people, they will live up to our expectations if we give them a chance. So now as we look at the second paragraph, we'll continue on that chapter, two, in that paragraph. Paul is still talking about the situation with that man he wrote about in chapter, in the first letter. He said, if anyone has caused grief, he has not so much grieved me as he's grieved all of you to some extent. The punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient. Instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he doesn't get overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, he said, to reaffirm your love for him. Paul acknowledges that the man's sin did affect the entire congregation, and they did the right thing by taking him to task and, and talking to him and, and doing godly correction and punishment. But he said, what you did is enough. It's done. You punished him. It's OK. Let him, let him come back. We, when we refuse to forgive someone, they carry that pain around with them. And it, and it brings about excessive sorrow. They feel like they can never, ever live up to it again. They can never be trusted again. And we can't do that to them. When somebody has, re, has repented and has sincere repentance and has changed and said that, you know, we've got to take them at their word and we've got to let them go and we've got to, got to let it go. We need to be good forgetters. There were two little boys that quarreled, and some of you that have kids have probably seen this more than once. By the next morning, Johnny and was, got his cap back on, and he was headed back over to Bobby's house. And an older, one, older member of the family looked at him, and he said, Johnny, last night you and Bobby, you hated him. You were never going to go over there again. And, and he said, you have a terrible memory. 
And Johnny's sitting there, you know, moving his foot around in the carpet, and then he sticks his head up and he smiles. He said, oh, that's okay. Me and Bobby are good forgetters. Because it was over. It was yesterday. There's no big deal. We need to be good forgetters as well as good forgivers. The church in Corinth had a good reason to be concerned. The man was openly saying he was a Christ follower, yet he was blatantly living in sin. He was continuing in a sinful lifestyle despite all that he had heard and learned. And as the church disciplined him, he had repented and demonstrated genuine remorse and sorrow over his actions. And now he wanted to return to the church fellowship. The Corinthians were just having a hard time with that. It's, it's hard when you've been hurt by somebody to just say, okay, I forgive you and I'm going to forget to bring him back in, to restore him, to bring him back to the church so that he wouldn't be overcome by excessive sorrow. When we refuse to forgive someone, we cut off our relationship with them. That's one of the reasons we must be forgiving in a marriage relationship. Paul wrote that we should never let the sun go down on our anger. A spirit of resentment and bitterness will certainly take root. In Ephesians 4, 26 and 27, it says, In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Paul wrote, Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. That's in one day. It says, Take care of it. If you need to apologize, do it. Don't just sweep your feelings under the rug. Don't become one of those that just says, oh, that was okay. I mean, if you're still angry, take care of it. That doesn't mean to explode on them and tell them off. It says do not sin, but to share. You know, especially those, there's people that like to stuff all their feelings in, and then eventually, what happens? They what? They explode, yeah. And that's really not good for a marriage or any close relationship to stuff all those feelings of anger and resentment in. Or it's one of those couples that one day all of a sudden the husband or wife is getting this letter that says, I want a divorce. And they had not a clue. We can't do things. We need to not let the sun go down on our anger because the Satan likes those things. He loves to get in there and he loves to make, turn the screws and make you more angry or make you exaggerate everything. I mean, it just, it gets to be a mess. What we can't give the enemy a foothold. We don't want to do that. Satan loves it when we blow our tops and we let our anger have control over our mouths and our actions. We're not reflecting the attitude of Jesus Christ when we lose our temper. Paul said in our anger, do not sin. Holding a grudge is a sin. Saying you forgive somebody, but you keep a record of it, is not complete forgiveness. We have to let it go. To toss it into the deepest sea and put up a no fishing sign. God forgives us completely and chooses to forget our sins. How can we do any less? From the Psalms we read, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. The Lord is compassionate and gracious and abounding in love, and he is slow to anger. What a great truth to remember. <clears throat> it's hard to show love when you're full of anger and bitterness. When we haven't forgiven those who have hurt us, it often destroys us along the way. Again, the psalmist writes, he will not always accuse nor harbor his anger or treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our sins. Wow. It says he will not, because what do we all deserve? Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. That's what we deserve. We were all born sinners. We deserve, that's, that's our penalty. But because of his great love for us, he forgives us and he restores us. Because God sent his son to take our place and to pay our debt on the cross with his very own life. God chooses when we become a follower of Christ, of Christ to be a complete forgetter. 
I mean, you know God can do anything. He's not, he doesn't have a memory that skips like, a, you know, like your elderly grandma. He, he doesn't forget. Or like I do, for that matter. I'm not even that elderly and I forget. But God, you know, but he chooses to forget. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all moral righteousness. So every time when we come to him and we t say, Lord, forgive me, I did it again, he'll still say, I forgive you. And then he forgets about it. We need to be the same way. Because if he can forget our sins, who are we to hold it against somebody else? Jesus is our example of living out forgiveness. Even from the cross, he extended forgiveness. He cried out, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. The very ones that put him on the cross, he was interceding for, asking the Father to forgive them. Not to give them what they deserved, but to give them forgiveness for what they were doing. What wonderful and amazing love. Paul told the Corinthian church, it is time to forgive him. It's time to restore him to the fellowship. Not hold a grudge, but total forgiveness. And then Paul concluded this section of the letter with another reason I wrote you, he says, was to see if you would stand the test and be obedient in everything. Anyone you forgive, I will also forgive. And what I have forgiven, if there is anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan might not outwit us. For we are not unaware of his schemes. Paul was testing their faith, pure and simple. He says, I'm writing this to you to see if you're going to obey it and do it. Because when I come, remember, he doesn't want to have an argument with them first thing. He doesn't want to say, hey, why didn't you do what I asked you to do? He's confident they're going to listen, but he's telling them, I'm writing this because I'm, I'm going to see if you're going to obey it. He's planning a visit, and he expects everything to be taken care of. I don't know, how, when, when you were a kid, did you ever get a list of chores that were expected of you when you got home? And what, what happens when, you, when, parents, when your parents expected you to what? Anybody talking today? Huh? To finish it, to do it, yeah, at least to do it to the best of your ability, not to totally ignore it, for sure. So that's kind of what Paul's doing here. He's given them a list of things to do, and he said he was confident they'll do it. But we do that sometimes. We, 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 give, we get this list, and then we just don't take care of it. But Paul trusted that they would do the work and have it done. Paul sends this letter with the admonition to the church, you've punished this guy enough. It's time to forgive him and restore him. Treat him the way you want to be treated. That's what forgiveness is. Paul also told them that if you've forgiven him, I'll forgive him. He trusts their judgment and that they'll do the right thing. He wants to move on and continue to preach the cross. He doesn't want to rehash old stuff when he comes back. He don't want to have to work through this problem. As the church was obedient to the instruction Paul gave, they would be ready to reach the loss that they were supposed to be reaching. Because while this was all going on, they were struggling to do what they were called to be doing. The reason, especially for the church to forgive and to go forward, was to prevent Satan from gaining ground. Any, one of the most effective ways for Satan to break up a church, a marriage, a friendship, youth groups, small groups, anything, is through controversy. When we're unforgiving, that attitude permeates everything around us. It, it goes through the entire church. Instead of being a place of refuge and peace, it becomes a place of pettiness and anger. We must extend forgiveness to those who have sinned against us, even those that are unaware that they have done anything against us. Sometimes in the church, we think, well, they should have known that was the wrong thing to do. Well, I hate to tell you, Maybe I should, I'm not, not hate to tell you, but you know, a lot of people are, play, are just playing clueless. They don't mean it. They don't even know they're doing the wrong thing. They just did it. And they don't know that they've done anything wrong. The Corinthian church was in a culture where you were sleeping with everybody, that you were doing, there was, orig, I mean, it was just mirrored our culture now. Well, I don't think we're as bad as the Corinthian culture yet in the United States. Maybe close, but not there yet. So that's what they were living with. That guy did probably know he was doing anything wrong at first. He needed to be corrected. And that happens in the church still. New people come in. 
we, we all have our preconceived ideas of what a Christian is supposed to be like, and then we put that on somebody else. That's not how it works. God, we need to, to, to share in love and to just let people have the time to grow because we all need time to grow. God isn't, I mean, Corey Ten Boom was 80 years old sharing that story. She was 65 when that event happened. A lot of us aren't even that old yet. We've got plenty of time to grow up yet, and God still has a lot of work to do. And, but most people aren't aware of what they're doing is wrong, and, and then there are those that just plain don't care. But to be like Jesus, we need to be obedient to his call. We can't hold a grudge. We can't hang on to our right to be angry. We must forgive. Peter said, asked, asked Jesus, how many times should I forgive somebody that sinned against me? And Jesus said, 70 times 7. Now, he didn't mean, Peter, go count. And when you hit 490, you can kill the guy. I don't know what he was going to do at 491. But it meant we always keep forgiving. Doesn't say it's easy. Couldn't have been easy, on, easy for Jesus on that cross to say, Father, forgive them. But he did. As we close this morning, um, Eric's going to come up and play a song for us. It's called Forgiveness. It's by Matthew West. And he, he's just going to play it. We're, they're not going to sing it through the first time. Just play it, and then we'll, we'll join him in singing it. But while it's playing, there are some sticky notes in front of you in your pews. If there is somebody today that you have not forgiven, there's somebody that you know that you still have harbor bitter feelings for, or somebody that you thought you had forgiven and you realize, you know, I'm still not trusting them. And you know, this morning, as I was rereading the sermon, God brought two names to me today. And I thought, I never even thought about it, but I thought, Lord, I didn't know you were gonna do that, but um, there's, and I'm not gonna share who they are, but I thought, you know, I think I'm holding a grudge there. I don't trust them like I should. So I'm going to put their initials. You don't have to put their. You don't even have to put their initials down if you know who it is. But I would challenge you to put up one of these sticky notes up on the cross, with their initials or their name, or just as a sign that I'm going to put it on the cross and I'm going to forgive them. I'm going to let it go. I'm not going to hold that grudge any longer. And if they don't stick, which is possible because this is dried wood, there's tape down here too. But I know the two names that are on there. And um, I was really convicted. God does that, some, does that a lot to pastors. Um, a lot of times the message is for them. And um, you can pray for me, as I, but um, it just was a real wake-up call this morning. So as, as they play that song,